Hello, I'm Glenn Kitayama. Welcome to the 2021 Los Angeles Day of Remembrance. Before we start today's program, I would like to acknowledge that LA sits on the occupied land of the indigenous Tongva people. I would also like to recognize the eight community groups that work together to put on this year's Day of Remembrance, plus the many others who sponsored today's event. Their names will appear at the end of the program. 79 years ago, one of the worst violations of civil rights in the history of the United States happened when President Franklin D. Roosevelt signed Executive Order 9066, authorizing the military to forcibly remove Japanese Americans from the West Coast into concentration camps without any formal charges or trial. Since we last gathered together one year ago, our world has changed dramatically. The COVID-19 pandemic has taken over 450,000 lives in the United States alone and has highlighted the racial and economic inequalities in our country. Asian Americans were blamed for COVID-19 and targeted through verbal assaults and physical violence in the early stages of the pandemic. Lower income essential workers, particularly in the Latinx and African American communities, have been hit particularly hard by the pandemic as the country shut down. Violence against Blacks is older than the founding of our Republic and is the cancer of American history. The 2013 murder of Trayvon Martin and many other unarmed African Americans sparked Black Lives Matter, a powerful social movement driven by the outrage over systematic racial violence against African Americans. The murder of an unarmed George Floyd by the Minneapolis police, along with the murders of Breonna Taylor, Rayshard Brooks, and Daniel Prude, inspired protests around the world and demands to defund the police. Immigration control and enforcement continued to wreak havoc on the Latinx communities. Children who were forcibly removed from their asylum-seeking families continued to be detained in prison-like cells to date, hundreds of migrant children still have not been reunited with their loved ones. And finally, the insurrection at the nation's capital on January 6th exposed to many the serious threat of white supremacy and domestic terrorism in the United States. While some were surprised that domestic terrorists would attempt to overthrow our democracy, Many of us saw this as an extension of what we already witnessed at Charlottesville in 2017 and was a logical conclusion to a presidency that embraced white nationalism and the darker nature of a society that seeks to divide us. So what does all of this have to do with the Day of Remembrance? Our theme this year is uniting with other communities to keep democracy alive. Many of our communities have experienced forced removal, forced separation, segregation, unjust incarceration, and the denial of human rights. We didn't suffer equally, but in the larger context, we are all harmed 
when democracy comes under attack. Democracy is fragile. The concept of forced removal and unjust incarceration didn't start and didn't end in 1942. When we choose to open our eyes, we can bear, we can bear witness to the systemic racism in our society and do something about it. Our poet laureate, Amanda Gorman, put it best. When day comes, we step out of the shade, aflame and unafraid. The new dawn blooms as we free it. For there is always light. If only we are brave enough to see it. If only we are brave enough to be it. Welcome to the 2021 Day of Remembrance. Today's program will feature Dr. Curtis Rooks, Assistant Professor at Loyola Marymount University, Mardiko Fujimoto Rooks, an activist and senior at Yale University, Mario Perez of the Inland Empire Coalition for Immigration Justice, Perrin Tanimoto, an award-winning fifth grade poet, and the musical talent of Kenny and Chisuko Endo. Enjoy the show. Hello, my name is Jason Fuji and I'm a member of the Manzanar Committee. I am proud to introduce Perrin Tanimoto, the fifth grade winner of the 2020 Sue Kunitomi Embry Student Awards Program. She'll be reciting her poem, We Are Americans. They took us from our homes. We are Americans. They rid us of our belongings. We are Americans. They held us captive. We are Americans. They called us the enemy. We are Americans. This happened then, our lesson learned, yet it still happens now. Maybe not to us, but to others. So remember, forever, we are all Americans. Thank you, Perrin, for your forceful poem and the reminder that we're all Americans. Next, we're going to hear from our featured speaker, uh, who has been fighting most of his life to become an American. Mario Perez was born in Mexico City and came to the United States when he was five years old. Now, as an Immigrant Justice Fellow at the Inland Coalition for Immigrant Rights, he is providing humanitarian, legal, 
and emotional support to people detained at the Adelanto Geo Detention Center. You know, from, from the beginning when my family came to the U.S. when I was five, um, there were definitely like these talks of, all right, like we cannot share too much about our info mm -hmm. be because this is our background and, um, you know, like this could lead us to, you know, possibly repercussions. Um, I don't think I really felt afraid until when I was finishing high school and I was having to like apply for colleges and apply for all of these other things. And I saw that those were not available to me. Like I remember calling to, wa to wanting to apply um, to open up a bank account and the, um, the person on the line um, laughed at me when I told them that I didn't have like a social and I didn't have like a California ID. So that's when it was like, okay, like this is, this is serious, you know? Mm -hmm. um, and so like, thankfully, like I think DACA came along and it was, it was a, it was a very, it was like a bandaid on a very bad wound. You know, it was like a very tiny bandaid, bandaid. Um, and so I was able to get that. But the thing with those relief programs is that you literally cannot make any mistake. You have to be, um, you're, you're held at a certain pedestal. You cannot make any mistakes. You cannot do anything wrong because it, it, it's just taken away from you. And that's, that's awful because you know we're we're already living in fear, like and and now we're living in in a world where we have to be perfect and we have to be the perfect immigrant. And if you're not, then you don't deserve to be here, um, which I think is just horrible. Adelanto is very secluded and isolated, and most of the detention centers are built that way for a reason because they wanna make it as difficult as possible for folks to be able to get the resources that they need and for them to receive any kind of support. So there are so many, there's numerous reports coming from Adelanto talking about um, all of the dangers, you know, in health and medical, legal, um, I think every aspect of it, every every need that anybody that finds themselves in detention, um, it's all very difficult to access, and families find themselves find themselves having to drive hours to visit their loved ones, and so it's they make they they literally make it a point to make it as difficult as possible for anybody that's detained to really be able to get any support or resources. So I really like for the community to know that um, ICAJ continues and will always be here for, for those folks that find themselves affected by, by immigration policies and systems. And that we are here to, you know, support them and be able to provide whatever they need at the time. And at the moment, I'm currently leading the Emergency Response Network, which is a hotline that we have available for folks. First of all, we, we want to document um, every arrest because we know that obviously like ICE is a rogue entity in itself. So they are violating numerous human rights. So we want to document all of that because depending on that, we can hopefully get cases dismissed um, by judges. And then also um, it serves as a way for us to like advocate for um, policies or advocate for folks that, that found themselves arrested under these like um, human rights violations. Um, and then also we serve as a resource um, as a resource for, for those folks that have, have found themselves detained or, or their families. So we provide legal resources, um, humanitarian, 
um, just anything that they might need em emotional support. A lot of them, you know, they don't know what what's going to happen. They don't know what the next step is going to be. And so as somebody that has lived through it and has been through it, um, I think it it helps kind of relieve some of that anxiety. There's many ways that folks can get involved and it all depends on their capacity. Um, we wanna make sure that the folks that do get involved continue to be engaged and that they continue supporting this movement. So basically if you text the word ADELANTO to 797979, um, you'll be able to access different ways that you can support, whether it be um, financially, um, as a volunteer, providing humanitarian resources, um, advocacy. There are many times that we're, we, you know, do find ourselves having to call our representatives or people that are making those lawmakers. So there's very different ways. So we wanted to really make sure that we um, have one way that one accessible way that people can tap into to be able to continue participating with us. I think it's it's amazing that we're able to um, collectively convene all of our coalition partners because every single one of them has some has something to offer to the undocumented and and vulnerable. Um, communities, getting to work with the Japanese American community, the um, with Nikkei progressives, and Never Again, and um, Haitian Bridge Bridge Alliance. You know, like we all have a lot in common, um, and so it's been amazing to like really look into their leadership and their perspectives to be able to continue doing this work, continue our campaigns. Um, and they're amazing allies. And I wouldn't, I wouldn't even call them allies. I would call them more accomplices because they are and have been on the ground with us. They've been at actions. They've been at court hearings. Um, they've held, you know, numerous uh, fundraising efforts. And so that is what a true ally slash accomplice is. And so it's it's been amazing and it's been a privilege to be able to like convene all of these different groups and all in all of these different communities um, that have so much in common and um, so much to give and to do.
it's now my pleasure to introduce Dr. Curtis Takata Rooks, Program Coordinator of Asian Pacific American Studies and Assistant Professor at Loyola Marymount University, along with Mariko Fujimoto Rooks, a senior at Yale University, where she double majors in the history of science, medicine, and public health, and ethnicity, race, and migration. She's additionally enrolled in the combined BA and PH program at the Yale School of Public Health. Well, we can't really disregard the elephant in the room, which is obviously the current pandemic. And obviously that has changed a lot. But I think in terms of how the environment today, both the pandemic and everything that happened this summer has impacted the ways in which, you know, life has changed and the topics that we talked about at that day of remembrance, which were right, um, looking at the legacy of, of Executive Order 9066 and Black Lives Matter and how can we put those two things in conversation. I think one of the biggest things that's changed between now and then has been this sort of national coverage and national and international dialogue about Black Lives Matter in a way that I think was surprising to both of us because I was at home this summer in terms of how many people were sitting and listening and actually willing to really deeply self-interrogate their own positionality, right? Where do I stand in this? How am I being complicit in anti-Blackness and what can I do to fix this at a personal level, at an institutional level? And it's always still an uphill battle, right? You have a lot of what we call performative activism, which is where, right, we all wear shirts that say Black Lives Matter, but we'll still donate to like, you know, police unions and you know that kind of stuff. But um, really seeing a lot of change and a lot of shifting in people in places that I never expected to. And I think a large part of that was because of the pandemic, right? Once everyone is sort of literally trapped in their homes, you can't, you don't have the same methods for escaping or um, being able to deny a lot of the coverage that was happening, a lot of things that were being seen. And I think also the pandemic made everyone contemplate their own mortality a little bit more. And so I think that because of all of that, there, there has been some change there and that's been really heartening to see in terms of what's been happening then. And even right as a high schooler, remembering the conversations I couldn't have with my high school classmates and seeing them then engage with me either individually or on social media and being you know, leagues away from where they were back in 2015. And part of that is just not being in high school anymore. Uh, I think we can all definitely say that, but you know, part of it too was actually having this time of reflection and engagement and also this really wonderful and incredible and also like exhausting but mobilized pressure from the black community too. For, for the day of remembrance, you know, in 2015, I thought it was important for us, for us to even bring the topic of Black Lives Matter up, right? Um, and we had uh, folks from the community, from the Black Lives Movement, um, in the panels and the, and the, and those sorts of things, and we were able also to talk about sort of even in the context of uh, redress and reparations, sort of the importance of the the sort of Black Congressional Caucus, right, um, and and uh, Congressman Dellum's uh, impassioned impassioned speech, right, that too often gets, um, I would say, sort of either forgotten or pushed to the side, right, around this narrative of folks like Senator Simpson, who happened to be great friends with uh, uh, Senator Mineta, which I think is fantastic, and that's important. And yet, without the Black Congressional Caucus, reparations doesn't get passed either, right? So both groups, both Simpson working with white conservatives and white progressives and Dellums working with the uh, communities of color allowed for reparations to be passed, you know, redress and reparations. It was, it, it, I mean, it was integrated. It, it, it's the whole story. But too often, I think in our, the stories we tell ourselves as Japanese Americans is that the Dellums component, the Black Congressional Caucus component gets left out even our ability to have citizenship as Japanese immigrants, mm -hmm. migrants, comes on the backs of, of America dealing with its original sin, right, of enslavement. And so the 14th Amendment, which allows for birth citizenship to all persons, right, to all persons. So without sort of Black folks, mm -hmm. the second generation 
would not be guaranteed citizenship. So there is no enfranchised and and aliens ineligible for citizenship cannot own land. We cannot use that back door and put the knit fa- the land in the names of the, of the children, et cetera. So we would have uh, uh, Japanese and Asians in general, right, would have been uh, their sort of settlement here may have been forfeit. And so, you know, I, it, it's one of those things where when we understand our history um, as a community, as a migrant community, Asians didn't come to a a place with blank slates. Japanese didn't come to a place with blank slates, right? It was based, built around both indigenous and black bodies, right? And what that meant. And so they came into that. The other part of it, which is interesting, sort of historically, sort of there have been these moments of understanding between black individuals and black communities, et cetera. And so you get an awful lot of Black Asian, Black Japanese communities. One of the first families in Sacramento was a Black, was a Japanese Black family where a Japanese man married an African American woman. But the stories we tell ourselves are often bereft of those stories, right? As a community. Um, so when we get to something like today and DOR and Black Lives Matter, sort of the, the place that we're at now it almost seems as if, well, where do we fit in, right? And as the conversation that takes place is, where do we fit in as Japanese Americans? Well, you've been there all along. We have been there all along, right? And so, so to engage it from this place of, we, we own this conversation as well, mm-hmm. right? Now, we might have to learn and study a little bit for ourselves, but this is our history too. One really good example that's related to DOR specifically is that, right, a lot of Nise and, and mostly Nise, right, end up serving in World War II because they are drafted in the camps. And after they get drafted, um, many of them, including my maternal grandfather, who was uh, in the 442nd, get the GI Bill and they go to college. And in my grandfather's case, he became um, essentially like a nuclear engineer. Electrical uh, engineer. Electrical engineer. One of those things. Um, But right, he becomes an engineer, right? He's able to save up, you know, He's able to be a solidly like middle-class person, right? He's able to send his kids to college. Um, He's able to send his grandkids to college, right? Black GIs didn't get that opportunity after World War II. They they were not granted access to the GI Bill. They were not granted access to higher education. And so playing that out over the next two or three generations, right? What does that mean if you're stuck in a working class job, right? especially as, as a veteran, what does that mean? Um, and what does that sort of create in terms of options for you and your family going forward? What does that mean for your kids, right? That's, that's a difference and that's a difference we need to hold and that we need to reckon with. If we look at 2021 outcomes, right? And, and understand them only in the context of the last six months, the last two years, last five years, we come to some really erroneous conclusions. And so for those of us in the Japanese American community where education is valued, right? We begin to say, well, we're not like them because without getting any deeper into the understanding where we probably share a lot more than we don't, right? Um, I wrote a piece for Nikkei, Discover Nikkei that said, you know, at the core, the, the two cultures in my household didn't conflict. They actually complement it. Now, the expression of those cultures may have been different, right? From the loud belly laugh uh, uh, you know, um, of the Black community to the more polite smiles of the Japanese American community, right? What was underneath the underneath, as Clifford Geertz would say, was really the same. Right, this this understanding of peoplehood and family, and the respect of elders, the, you know, all those different the respect of wisdom and learning. So for me, I would say individually, learn our histories, 
whether you do it through literature and reading something like uh, Nino Rivera's novel Southland um, that talks, that's, uh, I think does a really good job, or you read the sort of historical work by uh, Scott Kershige that really talks about, since I, I'm going to sort of be Los Angeles based at the, at the moment. Um, that's the work that we could do ourselves. I mean, as, as, as individuals, as, in, as institutions and companies or even entrepreneurs, interrogate sort of who do we buy from? Who do we have partnerships from? You know, where do we have our bank accounts? And I know there's a lot of sort of, we, we do a lot of, and, I, and our family does too, sort of support the sort of business interests, entrepreneurial interests of Little Tokyo, Japanese American uh, insurance folks, Jap you know, all those sorts of things, right? Sort of individual business and stuff. But there are also black merchants out there that you can shop from, right? There are also times when you can do your catering from, you know, it's all right to do something multicultural once in a while and have food from some other place, but sort of interrogate whether or not your default is mainstream. Yeah, I mean, I think, right, the, I've, I've said it before and I'll continue to say it, right, amplification of voices that are more marginalized than yours and doing that and recognizing the intersectionality of that. So black voices, the voices of black women, right? Of black gender non-binary people, of black queer people, of black trans people, right? All of those things need to happen. And that is something that you are very like capable of doing on an everyday basis. Um, and committing to the, sort of that kind of help. And remember, you don't have to do everything, but there are a lot of different things you can do, right? Um, and people will have explicit asks, even in spaces that seem performative like social media, you will see, right, these creators, one, there's normally some sort of monetary fund that you can contribute to, but they will ask for specific things about how you interact with their posts and how you engage with them. So I'm talking more, right, towards people who like are on Instagram a lot and things like that, right? Um, we know that the algorithm prioritizes saves and comments over likes at this point. So when people ask you to save or interact with a particular post, right, be aware of even those little things that you can do on a daily basis and then, right, in your everyday life too, um, just sort of, right, who, who is not in the room or whose voice isn't being heard and how can we work on amplifying those voices because the amplification of those voices will also lead to the amplification of our own in our own community and trusting that and knowing that, right, that is what solidarity, that's a large part of what solidarity is, is recognizing that it's not a zero sum game, right? things that benefit the Black community will also benefit the Japanese American community because we've seen that, right, with both communities, there's an extraordinary amount of, especially political power, um, as we saw through the last election, that is going to be dependent on coalitions of conjoined, like, Black, Indigenous, and people of color communities. Like, that is ultimately, right, what is going to change our democracy for the better and what made the difference in 2016 versus now. Thank you for attending this year's virtual Day of Remembrance. Thanks also to all of our participants, organizers, and sponsors. The full interviews with Dr. Curtis Takata Rooks, Mariko Fujimoto Rooks, and Mario Perez are available on the Nikkei Progressives and NCRR websites. Also, please mark your calendar for next year's Day of Remembrance on February 19th, 2022 at 2 o'clock p.m. Next year, we will be commemorating the 80th anniversary of Executive Order 9066. See you next year. Please support the Campaign for Justice Redress Now for Japanese Latin Americans. The JLA redress struggle continues. Last year, the Inter-American Commission on Human Rights published its ruling in the Shibayama Brothers' Petition for Justice. The U.S. government owes reparations to JLAs for World War II human rights violations. You can help by signing our petition to U.S. President Biden to comply with the Commission's ruling and to meet with the JLAs to secure reparations. To sign the petition and for more information, please go to the Campaign for Justice website and Facebook page. Thank you.
This is our parents and our loved ones' home. Many residents speak Japanese. How can they communicate if they are placed elsewhere? Many of our parents had injustice and were relocated to concentration camps early in their life. Please don't allow this injustice to happen. You see the wide swath of interconnectedness demonstrated here by the presence of David Silva from the Boyle Heights Neighborhood Council and Planning and Land Use Committee, Central CSO, Winena Mintu Tribe, and the North American Continental Network of Indigenous Women of the Americas. It is not just a Japanese American issue. It is a neighborhood community issue. Hi, my name is Kristen Fukushima and I'm the Managing Director for the Little Tokyo Community Council. Um, congratulations to the DOR planning team for another successful day of remembrance. And thank you so much for inviting me to share a little bit about our Small Business Relief Fund. Um, little Tokyo has over 400 businesses in the neighborhood. Over half of them are small businesses and somewhere between 50 or 60 of them are legacy historic businesses. And so in Little Tokyo, we define that as over 20 years old. Um, so far, with the generous support of all of our donors and supporters, we've been able to raise $100,000, which means that we have been able to do our first round of grants, micro grants to small businesses in Little Tokyo and are about to launch our app for the second round. So that's really exciting. Thank you to everyone. But our goal is to raise $500,000. And that's again, because we have about like 200, 250 small businesses in Little Tokyo. And we'd really love to be able to support all of them. We've already seen some devastating closures of our beloved small businesses in the neighborhood. Um, and so we're really committed to seeing how can we continue to support them and help them survive this crisis and everything that the pandemic has brought. Um, and so there's a lot of ways to support small businesses. You can check out other ways on our website, littletokyola.org slash lovelt. But one concrete way that we um, can support them is our Small Business Relief Fund. So you can learn more about that at littletokyola.org slash GoFundMe or go straight to the GoFundMe at tinyurl.com slash LTGoFundMe. Thank you so much and happy day of remembrance.